Welcome to another edition of the OUinsider.com podcast. I'm RJ Young. I am joined by OUI staff writer Colin Kennedy. Colin, what's up, man? Oh, a lot going on. A lot to talk about. Let's get right into it. 100%, dog. So the top 247 2021 recruiting rankings came out on Wednesday. We are recording this on a Thursday. What was your initial reaction to the rankings as it relates to OU? I think what we would first have to touch on is the fact that kind of what you've been mentioning, Oklahoma's in a strong position to land arguably two of its top players on its board, and both are happen to be the number one ranked player their position, both five stars and in the top 15 in Caleb Williams and Trayvon Henderson. I mean, for both of those guys to make the jumps that they did, Caleb Williams going from 17 to 6, taking the top overall quarterback prospect spot in the top 24-7. And then Trayvon Henderson, how about that one, man? 226 to 11. I don't know very many prospects that can make that kind of rise, but it's well warranted what he's able to do on a football field. That's what really jumped out to me. And then the guys that are currently committed, obviously Cody Jackson went up a spot. I think Ethan Downs went up eight or nine. Just kind of be expected. I thought both of those guys deserved a little bit more recognition, and they got it. Right, 100%. I agree with you wholeheartedly on Caleb Williams and Trayvon Henderson. Those are guys that I, I wrote about for the site. Check that out. But two things that stood out to me about those guys. Caleb Williams is the highest-rated prospect out of the Mid-Atlantic region in a decade. That comes from 247 Sports mm. National Analyst Charles Powers tells you what kind of prospect the Rankings Council thinks he is. Dual-threat guy, uh, along with passing for over 3,000 yards, had 838 yards on the ground, 18 touchdowns on the ground, ridiculously brilliant when the pocket breaks down, elusive as all get-out. And then, man, Henderson, <laughs> 2,400 yards rushing? What? 50 total touchdowns, 48 tackles, three picks. I'm sorry, come again. And, it's you know, the dog. Right. What I love most is uh, Steve Wiltfong caught up with his head coach at Hopewell. And he, he said, Hey, look, honestly, we got a great line and we got some great backs. So, you know, Trey didn't get but like 13 carries a game. And he still put those numbers up. God, wait a second. I'm sure OU would have liked it better if he'd have stayed ranked at 226, but now everybody knows who he is. Ohio State, Oklahoma are front running for him right now. So as you as as we've been talking about, it's nice to be in that conversation. And February is a great time to talk about hope in recruiting. Uh I enjoy that. I think there's no seriously, like I think there's more hope in the offseason, right? Like seriously, because like you know, it, 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 everybody's on the uh, everybody's still on the board for the most part. You know, uh, yeah. and then Caden Salter, who I thought needed to be mentioned as the number one quarterback in the state of Texas in this cycle, he's top one hundred, mm-hmm. number eighty nine. Um, dude, I'm really excited about this class, particularly on the defensive line. I know Jack Sawyer's already committed to Clemson. Uh, Clemson, Ohio State, excuse me. Sorry, Clemson fans. Uh, I I know there's a number of other guys that already just kind of put themselves where they're going to go, but guys like Ethan Downs are going to continue to rise up the board. Cullen Montgomery's going to rise up the board because he's playing opposite Donovan Jackson, who is highly ranked in this 2021 class. Uh, I also just kind of, I'm looking at guys that got offers that people don't necessarily know enough about just yet. And one of the guys that I know Dennis Simmons has been chasing and was very early on and immediately recognized his athleticism is one Mario Williams, who is ranked number 127 by top 247, but is a top 40 247 sports composite recruit. Like uh, another network, I think, matter of fact, might be ESPN, has him as, a, as, as I think, a top 10 player. Which, you know, kind of fits, and we've been talking about, you know, just before we got started taping, him playing football and baseball, and I kind of want to set you up for this by saying, that man helped Plant City reach its first state championship win ever last year. 42 years they've been playing baseball at Plant City, and this was their first win. He played center field, pitched, and batted 280 with 10 stolen bases, He's a two-sport star, and 
Oklahoma has had some pretty great success with that, as you have alluded to, Colin. Yeah, obviously anyone who knows me knows that if anything can challenge my passion for college football, it's probably college baseball. I just love the sport in general. I think it's a phenomenal opportunity and a great platform for guys, and I hope that it continues to grow as it has over the past few seasons. Because I tell you, man, every year I go out to Omaha, every year it becomes a bigger spectacle, and you get a guy like Mario Williams on campus that can further the success of Oklahoma's baseball program, which, by the way, is off to a pretty strong start under my man Skip Johnson, which is something we have to talk about. You mentioned Mario Williams, the fact that he's a two-sport star. I'm hoping to talk with him here pretty soon about this exact issue, the fact that he's getting looks by LSU or Florida, prominent college football and college baseball programs for the opportunity to play both. Now, why that's so intriguing to me is, sure, you look at programs like that, you go sign on with an LSU or a Florida, hey, I'd tip my cap to you, that's some of the best at football or baseball that you're going to find. But few programs have been able to pull off the level of success of dual sport athletes, let alone have been open to the even idea of it, like Oklahoma. Let me elaborate a bit. Obviously, we know about Cody. He came in quarterback, but also played for the baseball team as an outfielder DH. Where is he at? He's in the Dodgers organization, have a pretty strong level of success. Oh, then there's also Cade Horton, who's coming on as a PWO for quarterback, and he's getting a little bit of a look at scholarship for baseball. Now, that's big because he was originally committed to Ole Miss, who is, again, an SEC-caliber baseball program that has a high level of producing MLB talent from the program. NFL, not so much. But he committed to Oklahoma for the idea of both because of what the program has been able to do in regards to dual sport athletes. And the king, obviously, is Kyler Murray. I mean, I don't know of another program that could have made Kyler Murray what he was into today. I still remember covering the OU baseball team, and we were out there in Fort Worth, and Kyler's talking to me saying, man, I'm tired as hell because I'm flying all the way around. They got me in this jet. I got to go to practice in the morning and then play a baseball game in the afternoon. I'm just thinking to myself, like, how many college programs are even going to let their guys do that? Well, Mario Williams, I firmly believe, could have that opportunity at the University of Oklahoma. And, I mean, you play under a guy like Skip Johnson, Clay Overcash, Clay Van Hook. These guys are as good as it gets when it comes to college coaching. And then you go play in Lincoln Riley system with Dennis Simmons as your assistant coach. I don't know, man. I think OU is a pretty strong suitor for Mario Williams, and I think he's just a baller in his own right. So I can't wait to see how that specific aspect of this recruiting storyline continues to pan out. Yeah, man. Five foot ten, 165 pounds, absolute burner with great hands. Uh, I I think that the the next close. I mean, I got to mention it. Brandon Everidge, right, playing center field and safety for Oklahoma back in the day. And the, mm-hmm. the the willingness of these coaches to figure this out. I mean, I think we've touched on this a couple of times, but Bryce Foster wants to throw shot and disc at wherever he goes and play offensive line. And Oklahoma set out a plan on his last visit to show him how he can accomplish those things with the strength staff being on board and both the track and field team and the football team. Now, I got to tip my hat here to Lincoln Riley because, you know, I'll drag him when I think that he's, you know, out of pocket, but I got to give him really a lot of credit on this. One of the things that he's been up front and out front in is we tell kids all the time, play multiple sports. Don't specialize, right? Begin to develop skills in other sports. But when we get them at the next level, we're like, no, no, no now you're just going to do this. Not at Oklahoma, right? And particularly if you are that good, we all know you're that good. Why would we want to limit your success or opportunities to just what we're doing. I think one of the things that I, a large overarching philosophy of mine is help people, right? If you're in a position to help someone achieve their goal, achieve their dream, whether it's a piece of advice or allowing them to play two sports and you have the resources to do that, don't do not do what Kevin Sumlin did and tell them that they can't do it. Otherwise, Kyler Murray ends up at Oklahoma and wins a Heisman. Just going to throw it out there. Hey, man, and that's tough, too, because A&M's got a pretty interesting baseball yeah, program in its own right. A&M. Don't they? Hey, they'd be stop underachieving, as they always do, if they just milked that one aspect of the program. But 
my goodness, that team, they're just so terrible when it comes to handling that. But, hey, I- I'm telling you, man, Mario Williams, that's a dog. I really like what you're saying. And this is the other thing, too, is like, it's not a, even just the willingness to explore the dual sport aspect of things. It's the, the fact that Oklahoma is so is so encouraging of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're trying to get you to do it. Right. And so when they're milking that and they're just saying, hey, not only do we want to let you do it, we want you to go out and succeed. That, to me, is completely different than a program saying, yeah, okay, I mean, I guess we'll let you go play both sports. Like, right. No, we want you to go out and succeed. We want you to explore these other options. That is what separates Oklahoma, in my opinion. And if Mario Williams really wants the opportunity, I firmly believe that Lincoln Riley and Skip Johnson will find a way to make this guy truly enjoy both sports. No, man, uh, we saw it at Ole Miss where you just mentioned it. Um, I mean, Jerry and Ely and John Rice Plumley both are gonna are playing for baseball for Ole Miss right now. One starting quarterback, one was starting tailback. And they look good last year playing uh, in Rich Rodriguez's offense. I, I, I wanted to see what it continued to look like. Obviously, Lane Kiffin is the head coach now. And he said, no, nah, I mean, why wouldn't I? I mean, uh, if they're good enough to do that and our baseball coach and, and our support staff think they're good enough to do that, who am I to get in the way? Now, on the other hand, you know, there's there's competition and aspects of that. And that's where I think fans kind of get a sideways about, all right, well, keep the main thing the main thing, and we all know that football in the South and at Oklahoma is the main thing for many people. Like, baseball is still a sport where partial scholarships are doled out, right? Football is one where full scholarships mm-hmm. are doled out, and we, we see coaches pull that card quite often. Um, I want to pivot from Mario Williams and the baseball conversation to who do you think is underrated in this 2021 class. I mean, I, I I think we both would agree that we could see Mario Williams as a top 50 player in the 247 because he already is in the composite. But who else would you think is not necessarily getting their due yet? Uh, it's interesting. I think there are a number of different guys. I'll, I'll start off by saying that Colin Montgomery, in my opinion, is going to be on the verge of a top 247 appearance somewhere down the road. Okay. I just think he's that level of talent. Okay. He's a mauler. I really like what he brings to the table. And as far as underrated talents, I'm really interested in what a guy like maybe I'm trying to say how to word this the right way, because I have a personal connection to this individual in a way. J. Michael Sturdivant at a Marcus High School, my alma mater, is a baller and Oklahoma recently offered, but he's just he's just not getting the love that I think he deserves because he transferred from out of state. I believe he was in Kansas before. So he didn't necessarily have the platform. And so as a result, I think that now that this guy is getting the Oklahoma offer fairly recently, he's going to explode. And then I'll, I'll for sure give you one of my favorite answers is a guy that Oklahoma's in on. I've had a pretty good relationship with him over the past few months. He has yet to get the offer, but I think it's on the way. Dewan Lofton, hmm. he's from the Fort Worth area. This guy is a certified baller, man. Like He is so good, but he's not getting the love because he's at a high school in Fort Worth that hasn't necessarily produced a high level of talent in the past. And I understand that some may see him as undersized, or I understand that some may see his offer sheet and say, well, I don't necessarily know that he could come play the big boy. But if you watch this guy play, just put on the tape, you understand that DeWan Lofton is a certified baller, and I really look for Oklahoma to finally pull the trigger because he's going to keep rising in the ranking. And I know that, you know, for example, not a lot of people understand that team reporters don't have say in the, in the overall play ranking. No. Like, we got a ton of backlash right. for that, right. but it just can't happen. That's still me, though, out here trying to fight for this guy because I just firmly believe that Lofton is going to go out and surprise people in the next level. I think he's got elite ball skills. He plays bigger than his frame, and that will translate to the next level, especially in a strength and conditioning program, the Division One college ranks. So I'm excited about what those two receivers could accomplish down the road. No, and I, I got to 
throw one in there for our network who does seek out our opinions about guys that we think aren't necessarily being considered and will ask us to, okay, make a case for, for your guy that you think needs to be considered more highly. And they do take those things into account, but the rankings council usually does it, not usually, it does try to, to get it right. And it usually does get it right when we go back and we look at how the NFL evaluates these players three years after the fact. I think you hit mm-hmm. on a couple of kiddos uh, in the in the Texas, North Texas area that are, are going to get some love. And I'm glad that you have been there to see them. A couple of kiddos in the green country, Oklahoma area that I have watched that I think are going to rise up. One is A.J. Green out of Tulsa Union. Uh, the Union mm-hmm. Redskins are uh, elite. He plays running back and defensive back. He wants to play running back at the next level. However, Oklahoma in particular is looking at him to play defensive back. He's still got the offer, and I thought it might change with the with the way that Alex Grinch has been wanting to recruit to his defensive backs, going with guys that are six foot two and have longer limbs and uh, have the speed to match. AJ is still growing at about six foot, six foot one, but he's right there in that space. I put him in the same category category as a guy like Darian Green Warren, who I'm still going to be very upset that OU let get away. He signed with Michigan, and he's still one of my favorite players out of that 2020 class, and I can't wait to watch him play for the Wolverines. But he's got that same kind of twitch. He understands the game. He plays on both sides of the ball, and he's going to feature for them in this upcoming season. Another guy that I think is going to get some love that, frankly, we just don't have enough tape on, who was a two-sports star, is Kendall, Be- uh, Kendall Daniels out of bags. He's listed an outside yeah. linebacker, but that guy is a nickel safety. You know, the way that Grant Delpit played at LSU is what Kendall Daniels could be at Oklahoma. He has the side. He has the speed. He has the instincts. He took the uh, Beggs Demons all the way to the state semifinal against Metro Christian here where Asher Link, who uh, signed with Air Force quarterback, Asher Link had 5,400 yards of total offense, 73, uh, 131 total touchdowns, I think, over the course of his career, but 73 this year. I mean, he was a do-everything quarterback and all-state punter here in the state, and I, I don't understand how my alma mater, University of Tulsa, didn't figure to offer that kid. I'm gonna, I'm still flipping a table over that. But what I'm saying is it took Asher Link to knock off a Kendall Daniels-led team, and he had an interception in that game. He picked off Link in that game, and they just got stymied mm-hmm. after uh, getting past him, I believe, last year. I want to say this is in the 2A finals last year, but I also have somebody in the comments, I'm sure, will, will check me on this. But those are two guys that I really, really like, two guys that hold OU offers. And I think as we get toward the summer, two guys that are going to probably have their decisions made about what they want to do. With elite camps coming up, we know that we're going to see some 2022 kids come through, but we're going to see some more offers go out around that time. But we saw something like, I want to say like 30-plus offers go out in the last two weeks here, Colin. And, and some of yeah. those, some of those were like, oh, wow. Like, uh, there's one kiddo and help me here. Oh, you just gave him an offer two days ago and he was the fastest player at the national combine. Who am I thinking about? Oh, he's, he's from the state of Louisiana. I remember, right. I remember who you're talking about. I'm going to have to, and, and it, it's right I, there. I the know who you're tongue. talking about. It's on the tip of my yes. tongue. All right. Well, while yeah. I, while while I get research on that, um, what do you? I got another name for you. Oh, okay. Yes, please, please, please. So I I want to add this in, kind of as the cherry on top, under the rated discussion, because I wanted your perspective on it. Okay. I have a personal connection to this guy as well, but I feel like it's a conversation we have yet to have, and I want to. Okay. How does Deuce Harmon not have an offer from the <laughs> University of Oklahoma? <laughs> Come on, now. <laughs> this is unbelievable, man. Hey, man. I mean, this dude is a certified baller. He is a straight killer. I'm going to tell you right now. Mm. I have been there from day one. I'm telling you, I was around Deuce Harmon before it was cool to, to retweet his stuff and tag him on Twitter when he gets the offers. His pops is real close with me. I mean, that guy, Mr. Dion Harmon, has done a lot more for me than I've done for him. I appreciate him. Dave Young's obviously a really prominent president on campus. So how in the world, when he is two hours away, do you not offer Deuce Harmon, who is taking over the DFW Metroplex and program like Notre Dame are knocking down his door because they want him to come play cornerback? Is it because he's 5'9"? Because you, you tell me right now. 
That is complete BS. You look at a guy like that and not think, okay, he, he's all right. I, I don't care what you see in terms of height. Deuce Harmon, I'm telling you, can play with anyone in the nation. He is wildly underrated, in my opinion, and it blows my mind that we have that level of film, that caliber of play, and people just see his frame and say, no, we're good. I, I just need a second voice on this because maybe I'm a little biased. I don't know. Okay, so the player that I was looking up is Destin, Pas- uh, Destin Pazin, um, and that's that's the player that we were thinking about that was the fastest that's the National Combine. To your point about Harmon, though, I, I got nothing, man. I make this argument on my uh, on my radio show almost daily about TU and what it needs to be doing. I don't know what you're waiting on, except maybe you don't know where the kid slots, you know? But even then, I you, you extend the offer, and maybe you make it soft and say, hey, come earn it in camp so that we can see what you have and who you are, and we get to put our hands on you. Because quite frankly, Ethan Downs is six foot four, two forty, right? And I got to see this kiddo mm-hmm. at the Jim Thorpe Award uh, award banquet where the all state players come through and that man fills up a suit. I got to tell you, I'm looking up at him. He was kind, he was quick. And I was going, man, he had to go to OU in camp in June to, as he told me on, on my channel, I had to sweat my balls off to earn that offer. And I, <laughs> I was going, okay, man, because that's how hard it is. And that maybe that's what you see. But when Notre Dame is offering, Right when Michigan is offering, when when you have these quote unquote blue bloods who are showing up in your area to recruit your kids, I think two things. I think one, you think that you can just come in there late because you are close in the area and you have a footprint. I think two, you like somebody a little bit more than you like him. Well, damn it, it, it better be one hell of a player because as I as I see things, right, what I believe is college football is parochial. You and I, we grew up watching Oklahoma. Right, uh, some kiddos grow up watching Texas because they're from the state of Texas. You grew up watching LSU because you're from Louisiana. It means a little bit something more to you. It means something more to your community. It means something more not just to your parents but to their extended family. And usually, when you graduate, you go to work in the area. Right, you don't frequently leave or you come back, and that means more to use the SEC's term. In places where you grew up, because, I mean, that's the place where you're going to settle down. That's the place where people know you for what you did at that university. I don't see the downside, really, in offering a kid that is from your area that has the same measurables and talent as perhaps somebody from California or Georgia or Florida. I I, got to know what it is they see or what they don't know because I'm with you. I, I don't know why when we see these offers go out. This kiddo doesn't have an offer. I mean, I feel this way about uh, one of my 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 uh, one of my my best friends, uh, Jerry Ostrowski's kiddo Owen, is six foot two, two forty. He runs like a deer, you know. And, and to watch his tape pop at at, at Hall and Hall, I'm going, okay, so you're so you're mad that he plays two A football? Well, I mean, mm-hmm. what's what's your point here? I mean, and he's a legacy at TU, and I need them to offer him, and they haven't, right? And the same thing with. Oklahoma State and OU, and I'm sure people are going to get in on him as things continue to pick up in this 2021 cycle, but I think that's where we are, right? You send the offers out to the kiddos that you expect to have a hard time recruiting, and then you slow play the other ones until after spring football, after you see who's going to commit at their spring games, who's still going to really take this thing all the way out. That's the only rationale I can come up with because I'm I'm with you. I think he can play, and I think his brother being here makes it a natural fit but, you know, Oklahoma State slow played Dax Hill and then waited late to actually put the pressure on. He ends up going to Michigan. You know, it happens. Dangerous play. That's all I'll say. Well, let me tell you something. You think you can sweep in at the last minute just because you got the personal ties. You better really appeal to the young man that Amen. actually is dealing with the offer ahead. That's all I say when it comes to recruiting. Amen. Amen. Uh were there other things that you wanted to touch on? Because this is, I mean, this is going really well. But uh, but I didn't, I didn't want to pivot from something else. If you had something that you uh, you wanted to talk about, oh, I think that kind of covers in terms of the rankings and stuff like that. Okay. Well, as we get ready for spring football, right? There are a couple of questions that I wanted to address. One of which is wide receiver depth. Uh, mm-hmm. I had a question that I need that I wanted to address on the podcast, which is: hey, Do grad transfers count towards your scholarships? And I said yes. They not only count toward your scholarships, they count toward the 25 that you can take in any given year, up to 25. So Obi Obiallo 
needs to be considered a part of the 2020 class, right? As should Theo mm-hmm. Howard. And I think, you know, with the rankings and whatnot, you could talk about how those things need to be figured out. But knowing that Jaden Hazelwood, Theo East, Trajan Bridges, right, and Obi Obialo, along with Charleston Rambo, are going to be the five guys that have experienced scholarship players on that depth chart come spring ball, what do you think this means for, for looks? I mean, because they're going to want to be able to split people up and go good on good, sure. But you would love to have, you know, two teams out there that can get reps. And I'm not sure how you feel about it, but I think you're a couple injuries away from being in, in dire need of help. And you're going to need Marvin Mims and Trevin West and Brian Darby to show what they got. And I don't want to, I don't want to put too much on them already, but to ask those guys to compete at the level that they might be asked to compete. I don't, I don't know that they're all ready, man. I, I just don't. I, and that's not shade. That's just college football at this level. Yeah. And I'm also kind of concerned. You mentioned that there's only so many guys and they have to take all of those reps in camp. I mean, that's going to wear on you leading into the season when you're out there constantly in the nick of it in August. I mean, it, it wears down on your body and then you start the year and, those guys are going to be leaned on heavily throughout a grueling season. I understand that people will look at them and say, oh, well, they're young guys. They're ready to go. You shouldn't worry about what they have to deal with and can't. Well, that's where you worry about it the most because, as we well know, some of the most impactful things happen in camp in terms of injuries, experience level, what happens in terms of development. I mean, yes. I think you're on to something. I don't know how Oklahoma is going to plan on repping those guys in the buildup as season preparation goes on, but they're going to have to find some sort of unique pattern to make sure that these guys get the experience and development that they need while not necessarily going all out 100% before we even kick off a real football game. So that's the real worry and concern that I have in terms of the receiver numbers moving into the season is, the Sooners don't necessarily have the bodies to be playing these many guys and just expect them to carry over at a high level through a, a grueling several-game season. So that's what I would be looking at in terms of receiver death. How does Lincoln Riley, Dennis Simmons, the support staff, go about finding a creative way to make sure that these guys stay safe, they stay well-rested, while still acquiring the experience needed? Because, again, they're young. They're not going to be asked to be stepped on uh, upon the highest stage. And so I'm very, very intrigued as to how these guys take necessary steps, knowing that they're going to be asked to do a whole lot once those spring practices get underway. 100%. Uh, a few deeks and dinks and dumps as we get out of here. Um, Eric's, er, Eric Wren, as you wrote about, is accepted a grad assistantship at OU. He's going to return. Joins Will Johnson, who accepted one on the defensive side last month. And uh, sports director of sports nutrition, Tiffany Bird, is leaving the program after eight years uh, for another opportunity. Uh, do you got uh, a take on those things, Colin? Uh, I think that it's incredibly intriguing for Creed Humphrey that he gets Bill Beanbo, Ty Darlington, and Eric Wren on his side mm-hmm. heading into a comeback season. I want to see what he does with all of that. Will Johnson, I have a store, quick story. I still remember when Oklahoma State was hosting Oklahoma for Bedlam in football season last year, and as the starters were just out stretching about two and a half hours because the team arrived early, Will Johnson and Jeremiah Cradell were on the other side of the field working on technique and coverage drills. I thought to myself, man, those two have a special future in whatever they want to accomplish. Then Tiffany Bird, man, I hope all the best for her. She's left such an impactful presence, not only in her job capacity, but just as a human being. And so I hope whatever the next chapter may hold, it brings great things for her because she brought great things to Norman, Oklahoma. Right on. That is Colin Kennedy. Check him out on the Twitters at CKennedy247. That is CKennedy247. Does outstanding work on the website. That is OUinsider.com. A special thanks to all of our VIP members who help sustain the channel, uh, help sustain the website, and continue to push us to be better and to generate more. We're having an outstanding February, and we hope to finish strong. Colin, uh, I'll talk to you next week. All right, you're the man. Appreciate everyone for listening and watching. All right, brother.